Hello, Lydia. Hi, Masim. <laughs> How are you? It's good to be with you. Yeah, great to see you. I've been doing a physics all day, so I'm a little bit with my head in the clouds. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Really happy to be in uh, in the new location, in the new lab. So, Feels yeah. Really How you been? Feels very different, the new lab. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's in the mountains and it's, uh, it's really nice, um, uh, to be here. You know, it's, it was nice as well. When you move, you get to like go through everything and remove everything that you kind of like don't need, you know, the excess and all this and, Absolutely. you know, to start at new. Yeah. It yeah. feels good. It feels so good. You let so much things go. I mean, I've never moved the lab, but I've I've moved my house a few times. And I have a lot of things, so books and whatever. So it's such a cleansing process. I and mean, it feels so, so good. I completely agree with you. And uh it's been uh it's been good as well, you know, to uh, get ready for the seminar coming up, writing the paper, finishing the paper, all this is you know, is a lot. And I'm so excited to um, be able to go to Greece and uh, and explore some of these amazing temples and these amazing places um, and look at the ancient history, you know, like the earlier history. And you're an expert on uh, Greek history. So you want to tell us a little bit about it? Um. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm like by training, I'm uh, trained as an architect and I also did like a PhD on how earth radiation um, affects our health and how and why temples were placed on these areas. But I'm Greek born and um, yeah, I have uh, been growing up all my life with temples all around. So it's it's a rich history, like walking anywhere you go actually around Greece. Uh, you know, many times we have a problem with building new uh, constructions because there are always archaeological ruins. I mean, not always, but it's pretty often and that makes things more complicated. So uh, generally speaking, Greece is just like very rich in these temples and obviously in the historical aspect of it. Uh, it's like temples that are dedicated to different gods and goddesses. And we have these different energies, like every god or goddess brings an archetype and brings an energy. And for them, they it was really important uh, to, let's say, honor and give uh, like something back to the gods or the goddesses for different aspects of their, of their lives. So, you know, the different gods, uh, held a different yeah. Yeah. value, let's say. But another interesting layer to that, because I like to see things from many different aspects, is that if you see uh, like different temples that are dedicated to the same God, you start to look and they have like same geometric proportions. So different geometric proportion uh -huh. means different frequency by definition, right? Like just right, right. mathematics Absolutely. and physics. Yeah, the basis of resonance is, you know, the literal physical uh, proportion of a system. Uh, yeah. And yeah, you know, it's exciting for me because I am about to publish a really important paper uh, that unifies um, you know, nuclear forces and uh, the the nature of mass you know and gravity and um and it's it's showing clearly that uh it has to do with like fluid dynamics of the structure of space at the quantum scale uh like vortices if you'd like uh which are described as oscillators in in physics and and you know 
when they're described as oscillator in physics, they're described like a literally like a spring with a weight on it, right? And uh, and I just want to say, um, although it's equivalent to a to a spinning oscillator, um, it just gives you the wrong visuals right it's it's just not that the universe is not doing this it's doing this right and and so uh i'm just i'm just so glad that i'm going to well for for multiple reason um you know i'm glad to be going to greece because it's like the bastion of modern science right like these guys were like the initiator of modern science it came from earlier as well. It came from Egyptian and Sumerian and, and all this. And then we can discuss like there's evidence of even earlier than that in Greece, right? But, but you're talking about proportions describing a certain like resonance energy of temples. This is what you did your PhD on that, like me measuring, right? The, the actual uh, uh, geo uh, magnetic differences between the temples and and between like a ground state like which would be outside the temple right yes. but it, but but the I'm saying all this I'm sorry I'm babbling but it, it's just it kind of like to me it's like well you have a huge mass like that's the other thing is they built these things with like huge stones right megalithic stones um which we can discuss may predate the the greeks as well but but these huge masses would produce like alteration in the magnetic field and while in the gravitational field in that region, right? It's like you're creating enough energy, enough mass there so that space-time is curling in that region of space. You're like creating a vortex kind of deal. And if you're tuning the temple exactly right, you're kind of making these vortices at, at like, certain frequency at certain you know size and energy level does that like <laughs> make sense to you in any way <laughs> <laughs> no we absolutely love to listen to all your um, perceptions and analysis scientifically and all that it's always another layer to whatever everybody else is coming so uh, from my side yeah the main thing that i worked on in my phd is um, how the temples were like placed in areas that had these geophysical anomalies already. And then what you said, I think adds another layer. So the temple itself who created distortion because it has an enormous mass, right? All these huge rocks that they made these temples from. And also we were discussing in the last Tulum trip, if you remember that they also had the technology into them. So they had all the technology in terms of, because it is technology is what I explain in the course that I have in the Resonance Academy. It's like the proportions that have to do with the geometry that have to do with Planck, the dimensions and all these things. And then the connection to the earth and the astronomical connection. And that was from, let's say the architectural science of it. And it's a very complex technology that they have. And then you added the technology itself like the art crystal or the the more advanced right. or whatever they had at that time, right? So it's it's the whole being. And and as you mentioned, there was already geo uh, anomalies in those regions because yes. of um, ore or veins of ore that that ran in that region because. Uh, of water structures or yes and uh, the majority i have been doing that work for temples all around the world so the one aspect of it that i have found that is common in temples all around the world either we're talking about 
uh, Mexican pyramids, or we're talking about Greek temples, or we're talking about, uh, you know, the stone circles in all of Europe and some uh, similar constructions in uh, for, by the Native Americans or their predecessors, uh, is that basically they were chasing after the areas that had an anomaly. Now, what is that anomaly? I will, of course, during the trip, I will go very deep into that and I will show you maps and things that actually some of this, I, I will only show it in this trip. It's like work that I'm preparing for this trip and I have been preparing for a long time. By the way, we were trying to do this Egypt, uh, sorry, Greece trip for so long, and I'm I'm so excited that it's happening, and now the time is, and the the gate it's have has be, opened for that. <laughs> Epic! It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna yeah. be amazing. When I looked at the schedule and what we're doing, and oh my God, it's gonna be over the top, uh, and and yes. and being able to go in those places and feel those energies ourselves, you know, and it's like, um, you know, it, it is, uh, it, it is not like anything esoteric. Like you don't have to be like a guru meditating for like 20 years in a cave to feel it. I mean, you do feel the energy and, and you feel the change and, um, and, and, you know, the equations clearly say that, like, it, you can uh, you can make a direct relationship between information and energy in physics. And 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 so it's like it's a set of information. So so like you were saying at the beginning is like this is like a, it's like a, a, a certain frequency in each temple that like you know how i think of it i i think of it like this i i, I think of it as like you know the old pac-man game yes. you know and you know they would be coins and it would go click 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 yeah. every time you ate a coin you know and it's basically it i think of it that way is that when you go in those places it's like you're you're getting the coins, you know, <laughs> you're like, you're kind of like getting the energy, you're getting the coins um, yeah. and, and you're raising in energy and, you know, <laughs> as well, like spending time together all, you know, um, during the trip and um, between the whole group, like people have so much to contribute. People have so much, yeah. you know, to, to interchange and uh and with us with all of our you know staffers on the trip and and then as well like uh, you know talk story at night like under the stars in the most beautiful places uh, we've picked the best hotel we can find in greece i mean it's just gonna be Absolutely. amazing so you know i always say on these trips this is not a vacation because like we're no. like on, yes <laughs> we're on the go and we have lots to do but at yeah, the I same can tell time from the schedule. <laughs> at the same time you know we're roughing it in like five stars hotel so that you know at night we're we're comfortable and we have good nights and you know we're in beautiful places yeah, absolutely. Um, going back to the question, because, yeah, we, we went to a lot of different things, but I wanted just to uh, reply to the question you asked before. So uh, the, the relationship to the Earth energy was usually from uh, looking at temples all around the world. They were usually with underground water because because as I will explain also in trip that there is a way that that running through specific rocks, it generates an electrical current out of the earth and they were taking advantage of that. So there is another big correlation with faults. So seismic faults, active or not active currently. And there is a big correlation of specifically those with the ancient Greek temples. So also in Europe, we will see maps that we have that correlation usually with radioactivity, either the uranium content on the ground or the radon content. And then the question rises like, 
why they were going after that. So we will be seeing a lot of that and decoding why they were using that. Now in Greece, there is a big correlation usually with faults. And some, a lot, have also the underground water, and you will see that exactly under the main temple. And that's, you know, you 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 see the, the hydrogeophysical maps and the geological maps, and it's all there. So many years ago, when I started doing the, this work, I was literally mind blown. I was like, there is such a consistency for that aspect of around the world. So that for me was like a big revelation. To, this, to the way I looked at temples, right? And that also includes um, the Gothic cathedrals in Europe that are built maximum up to like 400 years ago because then that knowledge started to get lost. Uh, so mm -hmm. the latter ones are not so consistent, but there is an incredible and were, technology. Mm -hmm. And they were often built on pre preceding temples. Like they they pick the same geological anomaly because they were building exactly. on top of the ancient yes. ancient temples from the druids yes. and so on earlier. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this temple within the temple, we have seen it in in a few places around the world. I show last year in the presentation how inside Chichen Itza there are three more pyramids and they're built in different mm -hmm. times. So what they were doing with that is the whole thing that we can also apply in modern architecture that is creating this biologic capacitor. So you create a wall and then uh, air and then wall and then air and that kind of creates a whole uh, different technology that can amplify all these geophysical anomalies. So the more you dig into that, the more complex these temples are. And the more I start to understand also, you know, from all the things you've been sharing for so many years, how these temples are, you know, from civilizations that are far more advanced, and they know how to do that with precision. And you find that across all the different types of temples that I just shared before. So it's a, right. for me, it's like a. You know, yeah, I want to mention as well when we when we talk about geophysical anomalies, because that might sound a little negative or scary. Um, in fact, what we're talking is about it, about is uh, is region where there is an asymmetry that's occurring or an asymmetry that's occurring that is producing a coherent field like a vorticular field or, uh you know a flow dynamic right and yes, so that's yes. yeah yeah and 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 so you would think that that would occur over faults you know and over large um geological deposits um you know mm -hmm. of various material uh certain mm -hmm. material certainly material that's highly um you know energetic like material that could be radioactive or you know along uh uh lines of uh of uh, large uh, silica deposits yes. uh absolutely you know yeah did you find anything like that Yes, yes. So uh, silica is uh, like the main material that quartz is made of. And as we know, uh, it has very specific properties. That's why it's used in the quartz watches, right? It's used in computers and in, in so many other things that we are not aware. Why? Because they have something that is called the piezoelectric phenomenon. And that works two ways. First of all, you can store charge inside that rock. And for me, that means you can store information. I think you would agree with me, <laughs> right? All right, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And also the other aspect is that when you compress them, when they're other under compression, they will create a charge. So when they were picking areas that are high in quartz, it means that whenever there was a movement of the plates and there was some kind of pressure in the rock, that would create electricity. So again, they were after uh, using the earth as a battery. So they were using the charge to do many things that we will explore also a lot in this uh, amazing trip. And I wanted also to add that 
uh, apart from the different gods and goddesses being a specific frequency that is also expressed through the proportions of the design of the temple, there are also what is called the ancient Greek Orphic hymns. And the Orphic hymns were an invocation and there was a, a specific invocation to every single god or to every single frequency. And these are the most esoteric texts that we have from ancient Greece, at least the known, because I'm, I'm sure that there are other ones that, you know, they're kept. That's just my, my feeling. But uh, these texts are, they don't have a date. Uh, Orpheus, that is the one that wrote, wrote them, uh, has like a, a specific date that he lived, but it's not from him. So some say that they go thousands of years ago. And going back to what you said before, I think Greece has, I mean, we will see during the trip that our, around temples, we have different walls or different parts that are built in completely different times. I mean, if you just ha have eyes to see and observe, you don't need to be any expert or archaeologist or historian. It's just really obvious. Um, but like, what I wanted to share... Like in I, Peru yeah. and yes. like in South America, like in Peru or in Egypt and so on, you can see there was an original technique yes. of building, which is fantastic, which is typically with megalithic rock, which is super precise and all this and like jigsaw puzzle like like nothing you can imagine can be done and then you have rebuilt on top of it yes right yes. and and that yes. distinction has not been made in archaeology very clearly no. it's yeah no so, so and, and of course as you have said many times, doing just a carbon dating, it doesn't mean anything because if someone many years later just pasted, you know, uh, a, a ceramic paste or whatever, and they date that, that doesn't mean the original wall was placed there at the time, right? Exactly. So, it's not necessarily the same builder. It's not because you carbon date, because uh, we have to explain, you know, you can't carbon date the stone itself right because no carbon but it you can or you know you can't tell when the stone was cut even if you found carbon in it but um but so you can't carbon date the stone itself so in general you know we carbon date the organic stuff we find around um mm -hmm. you know can be the fire of this guy or can be you know the 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 repair of this guy or, you know, and then we tend mm -hmm. to associate those dates to the whole building as if, you know, only that generation had built the, the building. And, and it's, in my opinion, in many cases, completely inaccurate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, going back to the invocations, I wanted to share that. So these invocations are like very sacred texts. And I wanted to share something that is really powerful and many, like very few people know it. Uh, it's basically, and this is nothing esoteric, is, is this is completely, um, let's say, approved by the, the original uh, archaeological society or the historians or the uh, linguist uh, expert. Uh, which is that the ancient Greek language was read officially in three different ways. So one was just letters. And by the way, the ancient Greeks never left um, spaces in between their words. So they just wrote continuously, which makes it very curious. And there was a study on that about how that affects the brain uh, scientifically. That was very interesting. Uh, so That would be it, hard for dyslexic people like me. <laughs> yeah. but you know what i think that if you would have done that since you were young like you were born with learning language like that your brain would be different so maybe that dyslexia right. would be very different right right so that's what they right. found actually that that issues like hdhd or autism they improve dramatically through the ancient greek and through reading that way oh, yeah. which is very interesting wow 
Yes. Wow. So going back to the three ways that the ancient lang Greek language was perceived officially. So one, we have letters and language. Okay. So the second one was that the same num um, letters were used officially for numbers. We didn't have Arabic numbers. So we had the different letters used for different numbers. And so I will just give a very interesting example here that uh, when you take a text, you, there is a program that can transport, transmit that text, convert it to the notes that the ancient Greeks used. And then you literally listen to the music. And then you start taking texts like Homer's Odyssey and you put the whole thing on, on the computer and you hear a whole symphonic music and it's incredibly wow. harmonic. And then you start to, wow. to think, how is that possible? Like what technology made that? Like who actually wrote the Homer's Iliad? Like it, there's mm -hmm. a lot of questions because there is so complexity, right? And so um, you have music also. So that's the third one, which I just mentioned, apart from the numbers, you have music. So it's all this complexity with the numbers also uh, you have, I will share something that also relates to sacred geometry. So you take the number that the letters of Apollo in ancient Greek equal to, and then he had a twin sister uh, that was, uh, they were both born in Delos. And this is the sacred island that we're going to visit in this trip. Very special, the most uh, important uh, like spiritual center in ancient Greece and they were both born there and if you take the number for Apollo and the number for Artemis based on what letters they use for numbers and you put them in a proportion the number you get out is the phi ratio and then you start to think 1. like 1.618 yes. wow that's exactly. remarkable remarkable so uh, yeah you have the language you have the the music and you have the numbers and then everything is just linked to each other right like any like you have a sacred writing it, like by definition you have a number for it and you have a music for it wow well <laughs> you know that's really amazing because uh the the golden means um 1.618 so on uh it, it it emerged from the physics i'm writing right now yes. uh naturally i absolutely yes. didn't do it on purpose and it comes from unifying uh physics and it really i mean it blew my mind i i took uh with olivier like a week of time trying to figure out how, you know, I didn't believe it. I thought we must have put it in somehow, somewhere, you know, and yes. it just came back out and we're fooling ourselves. But it's, no, you know, it was actually, you know, coming <laughs> out naturally. And it has to do with the, re the ratio, the relationship between potential energy and kinetic energy and uh, in the universe. And uh, I, I can't wait to publish that part. It won't be in the paper we're publishing now. It will be in the next one shortly thereafter. But um, it, it, it's really exciting. You know, there's so many, you, there's so many codes and hints, right? To um, these ancient places. And so do you want to like go through a little bit of, what the trip's gonna look like, where we're gonna go and all this. And and we're gonna see like evidence of this earlier civilization uh, in Greece as well. You know, like people heard about it maybe from watching all kinds of shows, you know, uh, about evidence of earlier civilization that seemed very advanced in Egypt and in South America and Mexico even and so on. But not so many people are talking about it in Greece. So, like, let's look yeah. at the yeah the itinerary and and what we're gonna do and like the amazing places we're gonna go to. Yeah. Uh, just before that, I just wanted to share something more uh, regarding the invocations I was me mentioning before. 
Um, I have been working since many years training myself that uh, there is actually another pronunciation that the classical linguists just have overpassed. And the first time I heard the, the correct one that is not taught, unfortunately, at school and is not accepted by the conventional community, which mostly by definition means they will be right. Uh, I will be reading and I will be um, actually saying these invocations during the trip in this original pronunciation. And uh, we will be, you know, using them in the trip uh, as a wow. different location for the different temples we will be visiting. So I'm also very excited for that, for people to listen to the vibration because you know, different pronunciation and different sound is different vibration. And when I first heard of this pronunciation, actually I can tell you it's the first time ancient Greek made any sense to me because before I just listened to it and it, I didn't feel anything, even though I'm Greek, I mean, in this life at least. But uh, And then the other thing I wanted to mention regarding what you were saying about the like earlier civilizations, I think uh, that Greece has remnants from inner and sacred knowledge that comes from Egypt and before that from Atlantis. That's my feeling, like all this, um, let's say civilizations that we know uh, we had before, there's so much evidence and we even know, like, I, I can show a paper that like shows basically proves how there was an actual cataclysm, just geophysical paper. And they have all the results from that. And we know that happened 12,000 years ago. So there's like a continuation of that, uh, like with tons of scientific backup. And yeah, I will share the itinerary, itinerary now. Um, I'll um, just share. My I wanted to say something on that. Is it? Sure. Um, you know, it it is really important as well that like to to um, to know that like the concept of Atlantis and and an earlier civilization was first like at least disseminated largely by you know Plato in his in his uh, yes. three tomes on it and Neos um, and Critias is the book yeah yeah, yeah. and and so it, it does come from Greece right this 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 concept um it, he mentions that he got it from the ancient Egyptian priests Egyptian. right yes yes yeah and, and so you know but the but the but the 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 information came through Greece and uh and in Plato's account he's very very clear that it, this is not some romantic story you know thing it's actually you know a history of a real civilization yes. that was present yes you know. And something else that we will be also seeing in this trip is uh, basically uh, debunking the idea that mythology is just, as you said, romantic stories. And we'll be seeing scientific evidence to how, for example, uh, Homer's Odyssey or Homer's Iliad are actually events that happen. And they have been dated with a whole team, an interdisciplinary team of of amazing professors and experts. And these papers went in NASA's website. They uploaded them in the website. So we will be seeing a lot how myth has a, like a big part of it that is actual facts. And Plato is no different. He really wrote what he knew had happened and had passed from generation to generation. And as he mentioned, it was written on uh, the walls of temple in Egypt. So he got that information from there. And it's very right. interesting. Uh, how it there, falls together. There's so many questions I want to ask you, but we're going to have to ask. We're going to have to wait till the trip, because I mean, the fact that you learned ancient Greek already and you're fluent in it, aren't you? Well, I, I would not say fluent, but I, I we are all taught at school. Uh, but I have been training myself regarding these ancient hymns in this uh, original pronunciation. So that's what I will be sharing. And yeah. Right. Yeah. And where does that emerge from? 
Um, it's a whole group of, uh, let's say, specialists that are Greek, actually, and they started reading specific texts that they found from ancient Greek that describe how the Greeks were teaching foreigners how to pronounce because there were people that coming from abroad and they wanted to be part of the ancient Greek dramas, uh, the theater meaning, and we will oh. explain how that was integrated into a healing technology. I will share about that in the trip. So they found this writings and they said, well, here it's clear how they're teaching the foreigners to pronounce. And also there uh. are a lot of like symbols, I would say, that we call tones or tonos in Greek uh, over the different uh, um, consonants and vowels that in the past, they didn't make any sense. They were just there for decoration which, you know, you mm -hmm. see the, all the mathematical structure of the ancient Greek language, and you cannot believe that they bothered to put all that just for decoration. So they okay. signify very specifically how to pronounce. So that's what they did. But for me, I, I looked at the science way after. What happened for me is that when I heard a, a, like a specialist actually who did the research, do the pronunciation and read an ancient text like that I literally had like I felt the vibration how different like my whole body reacted to that vibration and before I had never right. reacted to that like it wasn't different to me listening to ancient Greek so I was like this is something that is right because my body's resonance knows that it's right it's not something intellectual mm -hmm. or spiritual mm -hmm. or anything it's just resonance of the body and the cells and from there I just started studying so it's from all this research. And I also wanted to say about your amazing paper that is coming and we are so honored to have time with you. And last year you shared a glimpse from that and we were all mind blown. And I will never forget that one slide that I will not say, share more now, that one slide that you show that everything fits together geometrically and that happened organically. And it's so amazing to, you know, have that uh, with you. And I'm sure you will share with us again so many mind-blowing things in this trip. It's so exciting. And yeah, we yeah. really appreciate I'm so excited. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome to be able to talk to people about these things. Okay, so here we are. Starting So here Athens. we are, yeah. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about the itinerary. So re literally, we have handpicked like the most important temples that we will see in terms of uh, they were important uh, as a spiritual center in the past, or they have, you know, some uh, amazing examples of, uh, let's say, very, very old construction. So I put together like this image, and this is like from different temples that we will see, and it's you know, it's all over like seeing Peru or uh, Lebanon or Egypt. And it's like, you can see also that these stones that have this uh, polygonal construction or megalithic and they have, they weigh whatever, like 20 tons each. And it's incredible. Uh, you see that they have this similarity and also they have different weather. You know? And you will see another part of the temple next to it, that has a completely different weathering. Like you see it's far newer and it, it hasn't been through so much um, like weathering from time, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can, yeah. So we're gonna yeah. see some of these amazing, I, you know, I always kind of like, when I approach these, these uh, jigsaw puzzle um, uh, walls, it just every time I, you know, it blows my mind, the precision, you know, the, the way it was built, how it was built and the similarity across the world, because that's another thing we're going to discuss is that, OK, there's the Greek temples, but there is the Egyptian temples and there is the South American temple and all these have similarities, but as well, they're geomagnetically, there's, they're geo um located so that they yeah. produce a, a collective field as well for the whole planet yes absolutely um okay so obviously the first uh, place we will visit is athens and that's where everybody will arrive in from the airport 
And Athens has, of course, the Acropolis Hill uh, with the Parthenon that is like really an incredible building. Uh, I, there is so much that we can explore and we'll share while we're there. It's built on a natural hill and it overlooks the whole of Athens. So the Parthenon was dedicated to the ancient goddess Athena. And Parthenon means the virgin. And this is the one that was worshipped uh, when later they replaced her with the Virgin Mary that is now celebrated in Greece. So it's, there's just a continuation of that. And we'll explore also the mythology and um, some other secrets that I've been told from a night guard of the Acropolis that I once was allowed to get inside there uh, just at night by myself. It's It's not possible to do that. And he shared me some things and I will be telling you like what is underneath the Acropolis during the retreat. So uh, many interesting facts. And also we will see the Erechtheion. <laughs> uh, this is like a, another beautiful temple that is next to it with the famous Cariatides or the girls, the goddess, the, the young girls that are, uh, let's say, supporting, as you see here, the, this part of the architecture. Um, and just below there, we have like an incredible, uh, gigantic megalithic wall. Uh, these, these stones are like a few meters long, and very deep. And there is a whole wall. It has uh, an amazing weathering that we will see that doesn't match other parts of the Acropolis. And there is like these full uh, megalithic connections. Just look at this, you know, like it's so amazing. <laughs> how they would just fit them so perfectly. And we will see it, we will touch it, we'll be there and we will see the precision also. The precision is remarkable. So Athens, uh, it was like the, let's say the important uh, center, like ruling center at that time. And also we will be visiting this amazing temple that is called uh, Ephestos temple. Uh, Ephestos was a god of, uh, let's say, uh, fire and um, uh, building and molding and melting and uh, all these things. And he was a forger, so he would forge things like uh, swords and, and we will explore that. But we will visit this beautiful temple. It's the most well-preserved temple we have in all of the ancient Greek monuments. So it's the most complete. So we'll be able to feel how it was like having a whole temple there. And then, of course... We will see the amazing mechanism of Andy Kithia. Uh, that is an incredible complex technology. Uh, and we will see it physically in the museum, but we will have a very special expert that has done uh, a very deep decoding that will join us and will share all that. And his paper was published in Nature magazine, all the research that he did. So we will have the privilege to hear from him directly, all his findings. And it's really mind blowing. Again, the deeper you go in this piece of technology, the more you understand like how um, more advanced these civilizations that created that and the precision they have to predicting different, for example, astronomical events, but it doesn't end there. And uh, this amazing expert, yeah, will, will share with us all his beautiful research. Then we'll be heading off, which is like uh, one of the most important islands we have in Greece. And uh, we will have a little bit of time there, <laughs> not so much, but we'll have a little bit of time to walk around. And um, the most important thing is that we'll be going to Delos, firstly, which, as I said, was the uh, most uh, important ancient Greek spiritual center. Um, and over there, it's not allowed to stay. So we were just visiting and coming back to Mykonos. It's like a short trip with a boat. And uh, Delos has many interesting features, and I will be sharing a lot about it in the trip, about how science and mythology come together about it, and how there is like evidence that this island is uh, most probably geologically coming from out of the planet Earth. And there are many things to that. So I will be revealing more about that. And um, this is a, a huge temple complex in Delos. Uh, there are uh, beautiful mosaics on the floor and different temples that they were using. 
um, and we will see a few of them. Uh, we can wander around. There is also a sacred lake there where Apollo himself was born. And we will explore more about that. Then we will come back to Athens and we will head off to Delphi. So uh, as you see here, first of all, we have an incredible megalithic wall that is absolutely incredible with <laughs> the most weird shapes. Right, like you, you have all this puzzle, literally. <laughs> the more you wow. look at the stones, the more you see like how impossible wow. it is to fit that together. <laughs> wow. Um, I uh, just can't wait to be there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we also see, can't wait to have you here, Nasir. <laughs> yeah, you see, uh, until fairly recently, a few years ago, I was unaware that these type of walls were present in in uh, in Greece. It's amazing that they're not really popularized and discussed. Yeah, we talked about it in your presentation at the International Physics Conference in Athens, where we first met. I think it was That's 2015, right? right? And then right, I started right. telling you, like, we need to do a trip to Greece. <laughs> There is so much like richness. Um, this is yeah. yeah. No, this is just another angle of the same wall. Uh, it's just really remarkable. Up there we have the Temple of Apollo, and uh, this was like a really huge uh, megalithic complex with a lot of temples. This is where the Oracle of Pythia uh, was giving her um let's say divinations to people that were coming to ask her and there is actually a lot of scientific background to that because uh there is like a, a cross section of underground fault and water in this place and i will be showing you all the geophysical maps and we'll go very deep into that so uh, she was literally inhaling uh, the geochemical gases that were coming out of this place and that was putting her in a trance along with some other things this is another part of the temple it's one of the very few circular temples we have in ancient greece it's a uh, called the temple of athena pronea and it's amazingly uh special in terms of its construction its geometry we'll exploring that a lot uh, also, Arturo will be joining us and he will be sharing a lot about the sacred geometry of, of these temples that he has decoded. Uh, this is just another aspect. And we will also see um, like the geological background of this place. Just, I can tell you just being there so many times, even if I bring people that have absolutely no background uh, in all these things, they can just feel the power of this place. I have witnessed it again and again. And even just the view, even if you forget the temples, it's just created and constructed in such a beautiful place. And we will also be visiting the sacred spring that Pythia herself used to purify herself. We can drink from that spring and maybe you can uh, share some uh, magical moments with us there with the water. Uh, so, uh, that's another aspect of the temple. Um, and I also wanted to share about Delphi that we might have the opportunity for a once in a lifetime situation that we can um, have a special time in this place. I will not say more, but I can tell you that this is literally once in a lifetime. We will not get another chance on that to, to have that. Um, that kind of activations that we do with you and with the crystals and it will be full moon so i will not say more i will keep it for for exploration during the trip uh so the next place we'll visit is in Yaves. uh this is also a very mysterious place that classical archaeology has not given it so much importance so there was uh, temple complexes there and an incredibly big theater uh, that is all carved into solid rock. <laughs> and we see again the same kind of walls that we see in other places that we will visit in this trip. And again, um, 
very different construction. Then we will uh, go a bit northern to what is called the Necromantion of Aheron. And we see again, full of polygonal walls. This place is, is really powerful. And uh, Necromandion means a place that people were able to communicate with uh, souls that have passed and they could ask questions and get answers. And there is an underground chamber down here, apart from all the rest of it that includes a little labyrinth uh, corridor, uh, that this um, particular chamber that is where they would communicate with the past ones. There has been an archaeoacoustics research here, and it has an incredible resonance. Like it's like a uh, like a chamber that is meant to vibrate at a specific frequency, and they cannot decode how that is possible in terms of its construction. So it has a lot of uh, scientific research to it that I will be sharing with you guys in the trip. So I'm really excited. This is a very powerful place and not very well known. It's not a touristic place that usually people go and visit. And then we will go more to the south and we will go to one of the most important ancient Greek civilizations, uh, which is uh, Mycenae. And this is the gate. Uh, we see these are like really like uh, cyclopean walls. The whole city has incredible cyclopean walls with huge rocks, literally massive and here, at just the entrance, um, the two uh, stones on the left and the one on the top, they're all uh, one piece. And when you see them, <laughs> when you're there, they're just massive. Like this is like at least four meters wide. And it's mm -hmm. like deep because it covers uh, all the doorway. Uh, and this is also another piece that is solid. So here we find again uh, the same polygonal walls and we, you know, this huge piece on the right. And then on the right, the stones become bigger and they become extremely uh, cyclopean. And actually it's written in mythology that these, um, these walls were created by the cyclopes themselves. And mm. it makes you wonder why we have the same thing in all the mythologies around the world. Uh, there is same mythology for Malta, and there is depictions in Sumer and in Egypt of, you know, beings that are taller and then humans next to them that are smaller. And it makes you wonder, like, if it's, this is just stories, why would people invent the same stories all around the world? Like, mm -hmm. there has to be something to it, right? Right. Totally. And uh... yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the story of giants is all around the world, and there's been a lot of archaeologic finds that support it. Uh, ah, yeah, this is going to be amazing to be there. I can't wait. Um, so I, I would like uh, to see here, I would like everyone to see how this is different, and then this kind of wall is different. And then these stones that make this stone circle around, and this was like a solid floor that was covered, uh, they are very different and they have other weathering and we will see that a lot. And right there, we will also visit three amazing megalithic stone chambers that have incredible resonance acoustics and we will be working with that vibration in there. Um, and they also have some polygonal walls inside them, but uh, for example, this piece that covers uh, the part below the triangle, it's like five meters wide. It's all carved solid rock and it's like two point half meters wide and maybe 70 centimeters thick. So it's a massive block. And um, the whole construction is just unbelievable. Um, I absolutely believe that this is far older than maybe other parts of the classical Greece. Mm -hmm. Uh, construction because they have different stonework, absolutely different. And then we will visit uh, the the most well preserved pyramid that we have in Greece. Not many people know that we have pyramids. It's not the only one. So uh, it's uh, it's its condition is uh, like kind of half, but it has uh, also the same kind of construction of polygonal walls, which is really amazing. Um, the, the energy inside there is so powerful 
And this is a, a place that we can have also more freedom to do things because uh, it's open to the public without uh, any like uh, limitation there. So we can do a lot of nice work. And this is how other part of the rock looks, which is uh, amazing. And um, we have ancient Greek historians mention that there are plenty of pyramids, just 16 on the same area. This is one of the 16 on the area. And there are plenty other uh, around Greece. And this is like wow. a common language around the world, right? We have pyramids. Yeah, all around. not so well known that there's pyramids in in uh, in Greece. You know, it's yeah. uh, again, you know, especially made out of megalithic rocks and and these kind of uh, uh, structures. Yes, absolutely. And then we hop onto Epidaurus. Um, here we have like a really particular uh, circular temple that had a geometry that we will explore in the trip uh, that was showing very particular, uh, let's say, constellations and celestial events. And in its underground, it had a labyrinth that was used for healing. And there is a whole process to that. So Epidavros had the most important healing uh, temple, which were the temple of Asclepios, and I will be showing you a map how uh, the majority or more than 90% of the temples of Asclepios in Greece were placed over an underground fault, which is really incredible. And Del uh, Epidavros has uh, an amazing uh, theater that is still in use actually. And uh, we do every year, we have uh, theater and concerts there, but the acoustics, are really, really incredible. And there is, if you go to the point in the center, uh, you literally can just whisper and people can listen to you all around. And also if you clap, uh, there is a specific sound, we will do that the same way we did in, in Mexico. And there is like a specific echo to it that is really remarkable. So it's a very powerful place. Um, this is just another view of it. And then uh, we will visit, the last one is the Temple of Ia. And here uh, I will show a really amazing uh, picture that you can literally see a vortex there. And it's a picture taken by someone I know. Uh, it's not a fake AI picture, I can guarantee it because it's uh, over 20 years ago. So there is a very clear vortex that appeared in the image. And here also we have fault and I will uh, explain more things. It's just over uh, the, the bay and it's like a really powerful place. So we, after that, we'll be coming back to Athens and we will be, uh, let's say closing. And the next day we will all go back uh, to our, our uh, destination. Nations, and of course, if some people want, there is the option to come earlier or stay a few days more if you want to explore Athens. And um, I'll be very happy to help anyone uh, to uh, where to go or visit places or restaurants. You know, I can I can absolutely help with that. Oh yeah, and I can't wait for the amazing Greek food that <laughs> we're gonna have during that trip. You know. I'm I'm actually getting prepared, like trying to like <laughs> lower calories every day and like make sure I'm I'm ready for like two weeks of indulging uh in amazing food over there. You should. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You should. I've been coordinating with uh the different places we'll be eating and checking menus and doing everything. Like my, I want to be sure that everybody. Uh, is taken care of because um, there is like so many layers to the, the Greek food and we will have like really the best of the best, like the freshest ingredients, the typical dishes, but with another twist to them. Um, yeah, Greek food is also uh, part of the experience, right? It's uh, all the journey with you, first of all, and you, all your amazing uh, shares and talk stories. I can't wait for that. <laughs> and then temples and then food. And we will be also exploring some naturally beautiful places. So it's like the whole experience. I'm so excited. Um, you know, the other thing is that we get such a an amazing uh um like field uh going 
as the group come together, as we connect, as we deepen our connection. And on all of these tours, we've had a lot of people come back and, you know, do, you know, one tour after the other. And it, it's like the field becomes so strong and it's so transformative mm -hmm. for everybody. I mean, I, I don't know anybody that came out that like was not transformed one way or another during the trip. And, uh, and, and, and for everybody, for me, for all the, the, the staffers that are there and, you know, all the presenters and not everybody and the group, it's like, we're going on a transformative journey uh for ourselves but as well to like contribute and participate in something bigger than us you know in the transformation planetary transformation that's happening today you know around the world i think a lot of people are feeling it there's there's a lot of chaos but yes. that's that's okay you know um, chaos is usually there prior to like great transformation and 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 let's let's come together and and lead that that transformation in in our power together you know yeah and i also would like to share from my side that i have you know my passion is temples and my mission is temples and that's you know how we also got together on all this temple research but i have visited temples all my life uh around the world but i can honestly say with all my heart like the way I experience the temples in the trips with you and the group, like the whole energy together, it's just a completely different way to, to experience temples. It has nothing to do with when I have been alone. And I'm, I'm really also excited because I have uh, taken uh, some groups in the past, smaller groups in Greece and also friends. And uh, um, I'm so excited to live the same thing now with you and the amazing people that will join us because I know it will be a completely different uh, layer and level. And then, of course, you add to that, you know, uh, your own energy and, and what you share with us on the crystals. And it's just so powerful. I'm so excited. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. I, we have Sarah with us. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Nassim. Hi, Dr. Lydia. Hi, everybody. Hi, Sarah. Welcome. I'm stepping in now because it's time for our question and answer. So thank you everybody for, for listening and thank you, Nassim and Dr. Lydia for walking us through it. Um, we're going to switch over to questions now. We have quite a few. So um, we'll spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so going over the questions. Um, first, just some logistical points before we hand it over um, to the other questions. A lot of people are asking questions about um, logistics related specific questions to themselves. Please email us at admin at spacefed.com. We'll put that in the comments, admin at spacefed.com for questions specific to your logistics, anything that's not answered on the website. Uh, many of you have questions about payments. Um, it's I know a lot of banks, especially European banks, they're very picky with security. They won't let you just enter an IBAN and, and do a wire without a million questions. If that's the case, again, reach out to us at admin at spacefed.com and we can set up um, you know, wire information for you so you can make that payment. Likewise, if you have a, you know, a cap on your credit card and how much you can pay at a time, reach out to us and we can work with you on that. So don't have concerns about payments. Um, uh, okay, jumping over to questions. Um, the first question, uh, can you please make a parallel between the Greek temples and sacred sites and the other ones belonging to ancient civilizations? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand completely the parallel, but what I can share is that from my research, first of all, there are like these specific uh, parts of it, design and construction and its technology that is similar to any temple around the world. This is the work I've been doing for many years. So either you pick Mexican pyramids or you pick uh, megalithic chambers in, in North America or uh, stone circles or cathedrals or mosques anywhere in the world, or uh, you have the stupas in, in uh, the Asian temples. Uh, they all have these same characteristics that we will exploring also in detail. So they have the earthling, they have the skyling, and they have particular uh, ways that the 
the body of the temple is in the middle is built. So we have that, uh, these two axes, and I'm literally talking scientifically, I'm not talking esoteric right now. Um, and these are absolutely um, coherent in temples all around the world. So um, I'm not sure if uh, that answers your question, but we also have the parallels also, if you like, uh, they are all for regarding the different gods or frequencies, as I'd like to say sometimes, uh, that you can also find around the world. So the Egyptian gods, pantheon of gods, they had the different um, archetypes and their different signatures and frequencies. And in Mexico, the same. In Asia, the same. So this is something that is consistent in, in temples around the world. And uh, there is continuation and there is coherence even though the temples might look different in terms of their style, I'm talking now an architectural design style, uh, and also they can come from a different culture or a religion background, but at the end they have the same technology, which is you know what we're focusing a lot um, and looking them from this perspective. Right. Yeah, I mean, we'll discuss all this during the trip as well, like how they are related around the world and it made like makes like a grid of interaction of vortices around the world that interacts together and links them all together and and you know that and and we'll play with that as well so i i can't wait it, it, um that that's a really good question as well and it really points as well to like a unified world uh, that is that there was some relationship, whatever advanced civilization was there before, there was they were all unified in some kind of knowledge base and relationship because it's too similar across the world uh, from civilization that later on had nothing to do with each other. Uh, but their initial relationship, might have been completely connected. Thank you. Okay, next question. How do they know to build the their temples on these geological places? How do they have that knowledge? Okay. <laughs> um, I get that question so often, like anywhere I have presented or shared this knowledge, everybody asks that question. And I ask myself the same question. And I know maybe Nassim will have something to add, but from my perspective, at least, uh, I can say a few things. First of all, uh, the magnetic field was far stronger at that time. And the more you go back in that time, uh, literally the value of the field, like today we might have an average in the world of 45,000 nanotesla. At that time, it was far higher. And just for everybody to know, uh, the magnetic field is going down. So there is a point that it will reach a zero that they will they, they say, like the geological, geophysical science say. Um, so most probably one aspect of that is that people were far more sensitive because also we didn't have artificial EMF and they could feel the shift of the magnetic field because the field was higher. So I think that's one part of it. And the other part of it is that I do believe they had other means or other technology or other advanced ways to just pinpoint where the anomaly was. Uh, so I think that it's absolutely true because if I look at the way that these temples are constructed, it's imp we don't have the technology to make a Parthenon today. So uh, it's it's very obvious. Even with oral 3D printing, we can make the accuracy, and that was uh, part of a research team in the Parthenon. We don't have the accuracy to redo it the way it's originally done. So for me, that says a lot about that question. Nassim? Yeah, uh, I you know, you find this all around the world. You say, wait a minute, like, how did they build this? How did they, you know, know how to build this? How did they, you know, it's not like you start building and figuring it out as you go. You got to, like, actually do engineering. You got to figure out, you know, like, for instance, why were the pyramids in Egypt put on one of the largest, you know, limestone, you know, structure that could support that weight. Like, you, you know, it, 
if they would have been put in any other region in the world on softer grounds on 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 uh, on plates geological plates that were not so solid uh they would have sunk and crumbled a long time ago and and so um how do they know to do it there and how do they you know it requires a lot of knowledge and and then you look at data from uh for instance the fact that the pyramids you know basically from the you know the relationship of the base and the height and so on describe the circumference of the earth or you know things like that and you go well how did they know that like that was not supposed to be known at the time um and so and so on so um like we said when you start studying that field and i'm really I, I want to make clear, like Lydia is a scientist. I I do a lot of science. You know, um, you're we're looking at this in a very objective way. Um, you know, and you study these places. Um, you realize, um, no, you can't just explain it with like a uh, hundred thousand slaves pulling on vine ropes. You know, in the middle of the desert, moving thousand million you know millions of tons of stones and 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 uh you know uh thousand ton blocks and so on like no that just doesn't add up um so so there was knowledge that was present uh and, and it wasn't just knowledge localized knowledge it was very much present all around the world and um and so uh there's a whole unknown story about humanity that's emerging there's more and more people that are catching on to it and and uh there's more and more data that supports it uh including finds of thousands of pyramids in the jungles uh of of uh, mexico and and uh, guatemala and so on that that are saying well there's something uh, vastly different than what we've been taught you know that that we're learning about. Thank you. Uh, going back to questions, just a quick comment. A lot of you are asking questions about Nassim's research, and for those of you that have not been on one of the trips before, he does something called Talk Story. Um, talk Story is kind of an ask anything, whether it's about the research, about Nassim's life, about you know the nature of the universe in general. Um, so you'll have an opportunity to ask these research related questions on the trip. Um, there's not only talk story, but there's Q and A after many of the presentations as well. And of course, time with Nassim. So hold tight on those questions until the trip and we can get those. We're gonna stay focused on uh, questions specifically related to Greece right now. Um, so with that, uh, the next question, were the stones poured like concrete? How did they get these hexagonal shapes? <laughs> Well, that's such a good question. So um, there is some evidence that some of them can could have been um, like melted stone. Literally, they had the technology to melt stone, and that is called geopolymerism. There is a whole research, and I will be sharing that in the trip. Uh, but I also think uh, they had this very precise way to cut stones. And we can see that all around the world. And for example, I remember Nassim was showing us in the Museum of Mexico some incredible stones that they are polished in a perfect sphere. And it's impossible to have that with the tools that they uh, say they had at that time. So uh, I think uh, there is like another kind of technology that uh, left uh, these as results. And, uh, they were able to have like an incredible level of precision, right, Nassim? Right. Yeah, and and, and uh, you know there is theories out there. Uh, for instance, there was French archaeologists that were talking about how they could reproduce uh, roughly some of the stones of uh, the pyramids of Egypt by pouring, you know, um, like by crushing limestone and then. Uh, you know, making a slew of and then pouring it in moles and stuff and, you know, and, uh, and although it is a possibility, it 
it doesn't explain all kinds of things. For instance, if you're making molds, uh, well, then you don't like, you know, in the pyramids of Egypt, for instance, and in these walls we just saw, um, not one stone is the same size. Not one stone is the same, you know, geometry. Not one, like, so this, this 2,300,000 stone in the pyramid of Egypt, like you're gonna make 2,300,000 molds? Why, you know, you you make a few and then you you make like same stones, like one after the other, if you're molding them and so on. So so the, it's it's a completely different technology and they might be uh, involved very high level of energy from very advanced technology that most likely had gravitational effects that would make the stone soft uh, during exposure to those energy level, almost ionizing the stone. And then maybe the stone was softer and was able to be placed because that's the other thing. One well there will look at it, but many of these walls, you can see that like, the stone almost sags, you know, um, you know, yes, the roundness. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and so it, it's like, you know, we'll discuss it during the trip, but it, there's completely, we got to think completely outside the box to explain these things. Okay, and the box you. is not a mold. <laughs> We get a couple questions about the ark. Will it be included? Meaning of the ark. Um, I'll just jump in on this one really quick. Yes, everybody will receive an ark crystal and a pendant. Uh, we we change the pendant that we offer at every trip. This one is going to be a special one, one that's actually never been for sale to the public. So we're not going to say what it looks like, but uh, there will be a special um, pendant with the ark crystal. And somebody asked, what's the meaning of that? I don't think we have time to get into that right now. But um, yeah, artcrystal.com, we talk about the science uh, behind the art crystal. And uh, yeah, we will all receive one that you'll be able to charge at the sites and, and bring around with you from the start of the trip. And uh, let's see, next question. Are you going to bring some kind of measuring instrument or devices with respect to the frequencies that can be experienced at these different places? Okay, so... And you are not allowed to take uh, such instruments in, inside the temples. They are very strict in Greece. Generally, around the world, in Mexico, I have had the same experience. So you have a, uh, to have a special permit, which we do. And it, it's like a whole application we did that it took years. And uh, we got it. We have, a, let's say, permit for measuring 50 ancient Greek temples, but that's like a specific time that we have to go with our whole team and the experts that are doing the measurements. And there is also a professor of geophysics that is involved. So we cannot do that during the trip. And also it takes a lot of time. So every measurement for every temple, uh, just to make it like more, um, more understandable in, term, in terms of numbers, it needs like at least 10 days of measurements. So you have like the actual data that you can take back to the office, analyze, put them in a chart, and then you have a result. So the few hours that we will spend in, in every temple, uh, they are not enough anyways to be able to see something. But yeah, they're very strict with that and they don't allow you in if you're carrying devices. Okay. Um, a lot of people are asking if they can't attend, can they, will there be a Zoom available that they can join? And will be there another, will there be another chance to join? I'll I'll jump in on that one because I, I I can speak to that. We try to rotate our locations uh, that we do. And so we may, we may not. We have a lot of places in the world to see with, with these magnificent temples. So Possibly, but we can't guarantee it. And no, unfortunately, we will not be recording live. So the only opportunity will be to join us. Okay, let's um, let's finish it with just one more question because we're running uh, short on time here. Uh, what is the main thing you're hoping people will take away from this trip? Okay, <laughs> I think Nassim will have a lot to share, but at least on my side, um, 
There is so much depth and richness in the ancient Greek culture, the mythology, the science of it, uh, and experiencing literally how the ancient Greek temples feel like uh, from a like a live experience. It's like the whole, having that whole package and understanding how to see these uh, beings, like this advanced technology that they have and the field that they emit and all that. Uh, from a different perspective than we have been taught. Like, it's not just archaeological ruins. Uh, it's just a whole other level of complexity. And actually, these places, which I will be sharing the research for that in the trip, uh, they have the ability to alter our brain waves. And we can have uh, different experiences or alter states of consciousness that are actually measurable. So we will have the opportunity to experience that. And when you add to that um, the, the whole energy of the group, which is so powerful, I'm always amazed by the kind of people that uh, attend these amazing trips. It's just the, everybody contributes and the same and the crystals and the temple itself is just a very deeply transformative experience. So I think in one side, it's just learning things and learning to see in a different way the temples and also experiencing them and having this deeper uh, uh, transformative experience. But uh, I'm sure Nassim has has far no, more. No, to that, that's that's pretty well it. And and, and you know, like I said, I, every time I'm transformed, everybody in the trip is transformed, and it's really a way as well for us to like, okay, you know, kind of open a door open a door into our awareness, into our consciousness, open a door to like universal awareness, to universal connection, like the deepest mean, the deeper meaning of our existence or deeper meaning of our presence here on earth and the contribution we're bringing to the whole, you know, like when we go in these temples, we're kind of connecting. I always tell people as we walk in, like we we'll walk with intent, you know, like it's you're connecting, you're you're connecting to the grid, you're connecting to the network of creation. Um, you know, you always connect it, but in these places, it becomes so powerful, it becomes so palpable, and 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 it changes you, it changes the way you feel the way you think of yourself, the way you think of the universe. And it really, uh, and, and you contribute as well to like the, the morphogenic field of all of the planet knowledge base. You know, you're, you're on a mission on these trips to like make a difference and you make the difference as you make the difference for yourself. And, and so it's, it's really powerful and I, I can't, it's hard to like say words about it. It, it. It's like when you ask somebody, you know, how is it to go to Burning Man? You know, it's like, you know, people say, uh, I can't really explain it. It's just magical. And it's like transformative and all this stuff. And, um, and it, it's really like that. It's hard to explain, but it's powerful and it's transformative and it's it's really deeply meaningful for me at least um in every trip i've taken uh with these groups and so i i you know i'm totally uh looking forward to this one all right thank you and and thank you everybody for the questions we're, we're just about out of time so just to wrap it up let me just repeat because we're still getting a lot of logistical questions coming in um you have the link to download the brochure if there's any questions that are not answered or were not answered for you tonight from the sim or dr lydia or myself reach out to us at admin at spacefed.com and our team will address your question or any special needs that you may have and um and I look for, I've seen so many people sign up who I've met at the prior trip. So again, one of the things that, that's so meaningful for me on these trips is, is the connections that are made. So I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody that I've met before and uh, very excited to see you there. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and, uh, I <laughs> want to add one thing is to know that when you are uh, coming on these uh, expedition with us, you're, you're helping us as well 
to continue the research, to continue, you know, all the work that needs to be done to be able to continue the laboratory work that's being done that can have a really critical impact on humanity and all this. So it's not, you know, that's another way that you're contributing to uh, to this next uh, transformative um, time in uh, in the history of humanity. Absolutely. Yes, everything we see goes into the lab, into all the Sims work, into the education, into the technology. So you're uh, you're doing this for yourself, but you're doing this for for the planet as well. So yeah, until time, next time, really... yeah. go for it. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, very honored, very excited to see everybody in the trip. And also, I just want to say, because we've been trying to do that many, many years, discussing this with Nassim, now it has happened, now the flow is there, now the, the, the portal is open, and it's really one of a kind what we are having prepared for you, and I'm, I'm so excited to share with you. So. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, until we're all together in Greece, may the vacuum be with you. Be good, be safe, and we'll see you there. Much love to everybody. Much love. Thank you. Thank you.